Welcome to this webinar about next generation dendritic cell vaccines. I am Cristina Conforti Andreoni, and together with my colleague Marius Doring, I will give you an overview on the past, present, and future of DC vaccination and an insight into the Milton Biotech solution for blood DC manufacturing with the Clinimax Prodigy platform. Let's start with an overview on the agenda. I will first introduce the concept of the C-based cancer vaccine with a short view on the history and status quo of the C therapy, followed then by a deeper look at the new concept of blood C-based vaccines. Then Marius will present our solution for blood C manufacturing with Clinimax Prodigy platform and how it serves the needs of many dendritic cell scientists who want to bring the basic research into clinical with a seamless translation. Finally, you will have a chance to uh, ask some questions and to discuss together with us some of the key points. We all know that vaccines are among the most successful medical interventions in the history of humankind, having saved millions of lives. And the first vaccine was developed by Edward Jenner in the 1700s uh, against smallpox by using material from the cowpox virus, from which, by the way, comes the terms vaccines, which in Latin means cow. Um, since, the several, uh, since then, several advancements have been done uh, to apply the concept of vaccination to other infectious diseases, thanks also to the work of Pasteur and other great uh, microbiologists in the 1800s and in the 1900s. However, only in the second part of the 1900s, in the field, the field of immunology started to fully develop and uh, the mechanism behind vaccination, the so-called dirty little secret of vaccines, and the natural immune response became more and more uh, clear. And uh, an important milestone was also, for example, the discovery of dendritic cells and their role in the T-cell activation but also the senses of pathogen uh, via TLR ligands and other receptors and the concept of antigens. With the progress uh, of immunology uh, research and, um, and similar uh, research in the field, it became more clear that immune response can be manipulated in several ways besides the standard vaccination against infectious diseases. And a lot of research moved into the direction of using the immune system to induce response against cancer. In the 2000s, uh, the field of immuno-oncology and the immunotherapy exploded, and we could see several clinical trials running to test different molecules and different cellular uh, drugs, including the therapeutic antibodies against checkpoint inhibitor um, and also uh, engineered T cells, so-called CAR-T, which in some cases we are also approved as standard therapies for some type of cancers. At the same time, the classical vaccination evolved in two directions. On one side, to explore the use of dendritic cells as cellular vector for antigens, and on the other side, with the development of um, uh, RNA-based vaccines, which, as you know, they were actually very crucial for the fight of the COVID-19 pandemic. And in the case of cancer vaccination, Another important player was the concept of using neoantigen-based vaccines. And indeed, the next generation vaccine and immunotherapy uh, in general are all projected for the next century on the idea that standard medicine should become more and more personalized and tailored on the patient profiling. We have seen that the, the next generation immunotherapy consists of several different types of approaches, but for this webinar, we would like to focus on the dendritic cell-based vaccination for the cancer uh, treatment. In this illustration, you can see how it works. So the idea is that dendritic cell can be uh, generated from peripheral blood of cancer patients. And the first step is uh, to collect the blood and process it to prepare uh, a leukopheresis product. Then the monocytes are isolated from this um, leukopheresis product and culture with specific cytokines um, that are the uh, interleukin-4 and the granulocyte macrophages colony stimulating factor. Usually after five or six days, the dendritic cells are fully differentiated and can be then matured and loaded with specific cancer antigen. Now, one of the, aspect, the key aspects of this therapy is to identify the correct antigens. So there are usually two possibilities. Antigens can be isolated from the same patients via collection of tumor biopsy and then given to the C in culture in the form of tumor lysate or tumor cells or tumor protein. 
But another way, um, and it's a new approach, uh, the future probably of, um, of the C-therapy is to sequence the tumor and identify the so-called neo-antigen, so personalized mutated antigens of the patients which then can be synthesized as RNA or peptide and given to the DC in culture. The other approach uh, is instead to use off-the-shelf uh, mRNA or peptides, whose sequence comes from the typical antigens identified as, identified as recurrent in several patients uh, with the given uh, tumor type, the so-called shared antigens. Once uh, ready, the cellular product is injected back into the patient where the dendritic cells will induce an antigen-specific T-cell response, which in turn will attack the tumor cells. Dendritic cell therapy has now been experimented in several clinical trials for more than 15 years. And which are the lessons learned? So in general, it is well tolerated and showed uh, some positive results. However, it is still not optimal and needs further development to reach a significant efficacy. It was observed indeed that uh, DC maturation is crucial, that the presence of functional antigen-specific T cells can really predict the clinical outcome in the patients, and also the um, patients with lower tumor, tumor burden have uh, actually more antigen-specific T cells. Also, it was seen that presentation of multiple epitopes on MHC class 1 and 2 is really beneficial. And in general, one big problem still is uh, the migration. The problem with troubleshooting of the C-therapy is that the design of the C-vaccine involves several variables to take in consideration. And even one single wrong choice can cause a suboptimal performance of the vaccine and even a complete failure of the therapy. First of all, you need to choose which antigen you want to use, so whether it would be an off-the-shelf tumor-associated antigen or a self-antigen, for example, a neo-antigen. Um, then we, you need to decide in which form this antigen should be uh, given to the dendritic cells as a synthetic peptide or RNA or as an endogenous protein lysate um, obtained from the tumor or endogenous RNA, for example. Then the stimulus is really crucial. As mentioned, DC needs to be mature optimally. This can be done with cytokines cocktails, with tiral ligands, but there are also other ways, for example, engineering DC so that they acquire specific function and maturation status. The route of injection is also very critical. As mentioned, the migration of the C is crucial, and whether the C are injected in certain tissue or in another tissue might cause um, a suboptimal migration. Uh, usually, it can be done intradermal, some try also intravenous, uh, in some cases, uh, intratumor, because then you will reach directly the place where the C can find the antigen. And many um, studies, as we'll see later, also focus on the intranodal because then the DC is already in, in the lymph node and can act directly to activate T cells. And a very important point is also where is the C vaccination applied in which type of cancer and which stage of the cancer, whether it will be metastatic, in remission, or even post-surgery in adjuvant settings, for example. Which tumor types should be the target of the C-therapy, the one with a high mutation, the one with a hot uh, tumor with a lot of T-cell infiltration, or my work also in cold tumor. And finally, we have seen that the C-therapy have been applied both in solid as well as methodological tumors. So this is also an important choice. And based on this, also the antigen should be chosen. Um, and a very final point uh, that uh, is becoming more and more important is um, how do you combine DC therapy? It's clear that probably DC therapy alone is not enough. Um, it, it has been seen that uh, it's often applied after surgery, which makes sense, and you can also obtain the antigen from the biopsy. Um, but uh, it has been also seen that DC therapy together with chemotherapy or radiotherapy can work in synergy for several reasons, especially the release of antigen due to the therapy. Uh, but lately, uh, many uh, publications have highlighted how checkpoint blockade and also other types of immunotherapy could actually synergize with DC therapy as we will see also later at the end of the webinar.
However, a very important point that we want to point out um, for the next uh, part of the webinar is the choice of the type of dendritic cells. So majority of the C therapy so far in the last 15 years was done with the monocyte derived dendritic cells. However, there are other two ways to obtain the C with primary uh, blood DC or with the CD34 derived DC. And in the next part of the webinar, we will see how uh, blood DC can be actually a good choice and how can be actually manufactured in an efficient way. So let's summarize which are the strategies to design the next generation DC vaccines and to make this therapy uh, efficient and working in patients. So as we mentioned, one way is to explore blood DC subset um, for the vaccination, as we will see in a few seconds. Um, we have seen that the role of neoantigen could be the future. So an improving of algorithm for neoantigen prediction and um, system to synthesize in a quick way, neoantigen is actually uh, critical and it would be uh, definitely something we'll see in the future. Um, we also should uh, um, identify which are the suitable indication and the right patient stratification for DC therapy. Um, in some cases, it has been seen also engineered dendritic cells uh, um, can be the way to improve the efficacy of vaccination and the potency of the DC together with the proper maturation and migration stimulus. The combination with immunotherapy seems to be really the future, especially with checkpoint inhibitors. And altogether, um, the hope is that uh, this different combination can really help DC therapy to be successful. But let's focus now specifically on the option to explore different DC subsets. So let's have a look at the blood DC based cancer vaccine. As mentioned, there are several ways to obtain dendritic cells. The classical way explored in the past for the C therapy was to derive them from monocytes. However, uh, both in human and mouse, it has been identified um, three different subsets that uh, are typical uh, of the DC um, uh, compartment. The myeloid or conventional DC and the plasma cytoid disease. So the myeloid conventional DC also divide in two uh, subsets, so often called CDC1 and CDC2. The CDC1 is characterized in human by the expression of CD141 and the CDC2 by the expression of CD1C. And they all have a counterpart in mouse, although in mouse, these cells have a slightly different expression of, uh, of markers. Blood DC can be obtained by, from cancer patients uh, in a similar way as described before, so via elutriation of the peripheral blood into leukopheresis product and then further manufacturing. However, in this case, differently than the MODICI, the cells are not differentiated from monocyte, but they are simply enriched from the blood. And then later on, exactly as for the MODICI, uh, it is needed to mature and load the cells with antigen. Dendritic cells uh, subset might have a very different phenotypical and functional uh, roles. Um, as described before, there are a lot of markers that identify the cells that you can see here. Um, and some of them can indeed be used to um, isolate the cells from the blood. In general, they have a specific development and uh, um, pattern of growth factor and transcriptional factor. In some cases, this transcriptional factor might also be used in mouse models to study the role of these cells. And uh, um, they all express slightly different pattern of, of, uh, um, of TLR, so uh, surface, uh, um, uh, surface um, uh, receptor uh, that are needed to identify the pathogens. For example, in the case of CDC1, um, the TLR3 is really prominent. In the case of CDC2, the TLR1 and the TLR9. In the case of the PDC, the TLR7 and TLR9. Uh, they express slightly different cytokine um, 
uh, cytokines. So in the case of CDC1, they are main producer, producer of the type 3 interferon, the so-called interferon lambda, but also VIL-12 and uh, type 1 interferon in lower levels. Whereas uh, the CDC2 express more pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines, um, including the IL-12. The PDC instead express the type 1 interferons mainly. Um, they are located also slightly differently in vivo. Uh, in the case of CDC2 and CDC1, they are residents in the lymph node and they can found, be found in blood, although in, in lower levels, especially for the CDC1. Um, and the migratory subset are present in peripheral tissue and lymph nodes. In the case of the PDC, um, they are resident in lymphoid tissue and it can be also found in blood, but also, for example, in lung, in the case of mouse and tonsils. These cells might have overlapping function, of course, but they are a bit like specialized in different uh, activities. So for example, in the case of CDC1, they are um, uh, highly specialized in cross presentation, so in the activation of the response CD8 and, CD and TH1 um, T cells. Uh, that is very important against tumors and intracellular pathogen. That's why they are really correlating with a beneficial prognosis in cancer. In the case of CDC2, uh, they depend really on the conditions. So depending on the cytokine cocktail and milieu, uh, they might uh, induce either Th1, Th2, or Th17 polarization. In some cases, also CD8 or T cell response uh, via cross presentation, but in a less um, in a less uh, um, strong way than the uh, CDC1. And they also respond to extracellular pathogens and allergens. That's why they are also um, involved in, in these diseases, um, mostly um, more than uh, other subsets. Um, they also maintain the Treg and uh, Th17 homeostasis in lung and gut. In the case of PDC instead, they are the first uh, camera, the first uh, um, cells activated during the uh, inflammatory response. They are really fast. And they do this, as we mentioned before, with the production of lot interferon type 1. Mm, they can stimulate also by cross presentation of CD8. Um, and they, in some cases, correlate with a poor prognosis in cancer, although this is still a bit debated and depend on the situation. Um, in general, however, all the subset um, of dendritic cells, they are not really well studied yet in the tolerogenic role. Whereas, for example, in the case of MODIC, uh, they are uh, also um, able to induce toler tolerance uh, um, in some situation upon certain stimulation. So we have seen how different dendritic cell subsets have different phenotypes and also different functionalities. Now, it's possible to take advantage of these different specializations to build up specific therapies uh, that can be different for different cancer type or, or different conditions. Uh, here we can see some preliminary results of the use of blood and reticent subset in the cancer immunotherapy. So as I mentioned, uh, functionalities and the possibility to play with functionalities is definitely an advantage compared to MODIC. And it is also um, hypothesized that uh, the uh, different uh, subset might have also a superior antigen presenting uh, features compared to the MODIC. Uh, another advantage of this uh, subset or blood DC compared to uh, MODIC generation is that it's much quicker. It can be done uh, with an enrichment taking only a few hours uh, and a maximum of 24 hours uh, for a total maturation and antigen loading. And this also implies that there is less variability in the process, so it's more possible it is possible to control better uh, the manufacturing compared to the MODIC system. Um, in this slide, you can see a very nice example of how different subset of dendritic cells uh, can also give different results depending on the context. Um, on the left side, you see a pre preclinical um, a model uh, in mouse of two different types of cancer, where uh, uh, depending on the on the experimental setting and the, and the and the cancer actually is either the CDC1 or the CDC2 subset that is most successful uh, in the uh, in the reducing the tumor volume. And on the right side is a nice example of a clinical trials run uh, using plasma cytoid dendritic cell vaccination, where you can clearly see an advantage uh, um, on the um, on the cohort of, of patients compared to matched controls. So to summarize this first part, we can see that the dendritic cell-based vaccination has for sure some advantages. 
um, first of all, you can choose one or more specific DC subset based on the functionality. You can control the adjuvant and the antigen co-delivery. You can also have extensive choice of adjuvants to play with, and also the antigen diversity is still under exploration. And uh, in general, we know that personalized products might enhance efficacy. However, there are still a lot of disadvantages. So uh, an autologous cell therapy requires definitely more complex manufacturing and logistic issue when it's not off the shelf. Um, and uh, the, we know that the, the migration of the C2 lymph node is still not optimal. So there's still a lot of um, part uh, to, to fix and to fine tune to make this therapy really working. And there's also another practical aspect that especially for blood DC, um, the cells have a very limited number. So indeed we have seen how different dendritic cell subset from blood can have a very low uh, frequency. And you can notice this from this data on the right side, especially for the subset of CDC1, it can be extremely rare. This is one of the many challenges in working with blood DC. Uh, another one is also to establish a reliable cell culture system to make sure that the few cells um, that you get from the enrichment, that they are uh, fully um, functional and, uh, and, able and, and viable and able to activate these cells. Uh, and finally, all these different steps of manufacturing require uh, the need of a robust and simple flow cytometry uh, strategy um, that is necessary uh, to to QC properly the DC subset with the um, one that can be also a complex uh, gating strategy uh, and also eventually a potency assay to measure how they uh, activate T cells. So we have seen um, how many uh, different points uh, can be a challenge for uh, a researcher that decide to go into uh, dendritic cell manufacturing. However, um, we can suggest ways to solve these problems uh, and um, uh, to, to overcome some of these issues uh, uh, with our Climax Prodigy platform. And uh, uh, you will hear soon from uh, uh, Marius um, uh, how you could uh, really optimize uh, uh, blood seed dendritic cell, so blood dendritic cell manufacturing with our Climax Prodigy. Thank you very much, Christina. My name is Marius, and I would like to show you how the Clinimax Prodigy platform addresses the challenges for the manufacture of cell-based cancer vaccines. Generally speaking, there are a number of requirements for sustainable cell manufacturing. It is important to have an automated and scalable system that provides high reproducibility. Further, Standardized quality controls and potency assays, as well as standardized protocols, are essential. And finally, the ease of handling patient-derived samples and cost efficiency of such systems are very important factors. These requirements were the starting point for the development of the Clinimax Prodigy. It allows, among other functions, automated generation of several cell types, such as dendritic cells, in a closed setting. The operator can attach the cell source, such as leukophoresis, and all the reagents needed for the process to the hangers on top of the instrument. All the ports are then connected to a single-use disposable sterile tubing set. The instrument will then move the cells inside the tubing set during the process via a peristaltic pump. While a graphic interface guides the user through the process step-by-step, step, the barcode reader allows to register lot numbers and identification codes of samples to minimize the risk of recording errors. Once the process starts, the target cells are labeled and enriched via magnetic separation and moved to the cultivation chamber for eventual maturation and antigen loading in case of dendritic cells. Sampling pouches allow to easily collect a fraction of cells to at several steps of the process for quality controls. The Clinimax Prodigy blood disease system is a two-step process in compassing the depletion of B cells and monocytes during the pre-depletion and the subsequent enrichment with the option for culture of the three DC subsets. The pre-depletion allows the preparation of up to 40 billion white blood cells in as much as 600 milliliters during a process time of up to five hours with only 45 minutes of hands-on time. The three DC subsets can equally be enriched from 40 billion cells to a purity of up to 90%, averaging a yield of 60%. For the enrichment and culture process, the estimated hands-on time is two hours during a process that can last up to 24 hours if DCs are cultured, matured, and loaded with antigens. 
The system was designed in a way that the user may choose from four different preset cases. These cases are grouped into two enrichment and culture cases and two enrichment only cases. In each group, the user may choose from the enrichment of PDC and CDC2s or the enrichment of CDC1, CDC2s and PDCs. In case, of, uh, in case the DCs are cultured, the user needs to attach suitable medium to the instrument and then thanks to the flexible protocol gets to program the time point for the administration of the stimulation reagent and the antigen loading. Let's look at some of the performance data obtained with the blood DC system using enrichment only cases. PDCs identified by their expression of CD123 and CD303 were obtained to purities of up to 30% while CDC1s, identified by the expression of CD141, could be obtained to purities of up to 8%. And lastly, CDC2s, identified by the expression of FC, Epsilon, Receptor 1 and CD1C, could be obtained to purities of up to 35%. On the top right panel, you can see that across many different donors, these purities were reproducibly obtained. And taken together, all these three subsets in a group that we now call the blood DC group, we can show that across many different donors, we reliably um, isolate these blood DCs up to frequencies between 67 and 70 percent, exhibiting a viability between 90 and 100 percent. So in conclusion, starting from 1 billion white blood cells, we can obtain 10 million blood DCs. However, the recovery rate across different donors still varies greatly. Now, what about the functionality of these three DC subsets? In order to induce cytokine secretions by all three subsets, we had to find a combination of pattern recognition receptor ligands that would induce the activation of all three subsets. It is known from the literature that PTCs mainly express TLR7 and TLR9, while in CDCs, the combinations of other TLRs have been described, namely TLR3 is expressed in both CDC1s and CDC2s. Thus, using the combination of poly-IC, a TLR3 ligand, and R848, a TLR7-8 ligand, we should be able to induce the expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines and interference. And consequently, upon 24-hour in vitro stimulation of these blood DCs using R848 and poly-IC, we can detect the expression of interferon alpha IL-6 IL-10, IL-12, TNF-alpha, and interferon lambda. And in line with these results, we could also detect the upregulation of the activation marker CD80 on all DC subsets 24 hours after stimulation with the combination of R848 and poly-IC. Similar results were obtained for the activation marker CD86 and also the chemokine receptor CCR7. Finally, we tested the capacity of our blood DCs to re-stimulate antigen-specific T cells um, in vitro in classic re-stimulation experiments. To this end, we loaded our blood DCs with different types of the PP65 um, immunodominant CMV-derived antigen and co-cultured them with T cells. And we could show that only in the presence of either the mRNA coding for PP65 or the peptide, um, uh, a specific immunodominant peptide of the PP65, the whole PP65 protein or the peptivator peptide pool, CD8 positive, tetramer positive T cells expanded. And we could also show further that the proliferation of these uh, cells was mainly found amongst tetramer positive CD8 T cells. And finally, in order to um, assess the quality and also composition of our blood DCs, we have developed in collaboration with Yolanda de Vries from the Nijmegen University, a fax panel um, that allows us to identify our blood DC subsets. Real quick, as an overview, we would exclude the debris, only gate on live cells using the live dead marker 7AAD. Um, further gate on CD45 positive cells and from there select the site scatter low cells. Then we would exclude all CD14 and CD20 positive cells and from there we check the abundance of PDCs by the markers that I mentioned before CD123 and CD303 and also the abundance of CDC1s by the expression of CD141.
Here from this, we have to apply a little trick and use the non-gate, basically exclude the CD1 for once and then exclude also the CD1 to three positive cells in order to get a pure um, population of our FC epsilon receptor one expressing and CD1C1 expressing CDC2s. All these uh, phenotyping protocols and the details um, of these protocols can be found online under the link provided here. So for the last part of this webinar, we would like to discuss a couple of examples on um, how to possibly enhance um, DC-based vaccinations by combining it with other immunotherapies such as checkpoint inhibitor blockade. Um, and to this end, I would like to remind everybody on the function of checkpoint inhibitor blockade. Um, T cells are recognized as the main effector cells fighting tumors. Um, and to this end, these tumors um, have to be infiltrated by T cells. Thus, the presence is very important. These T cells have to be functional and these T cells have to recognize the tumor associated antigens. However, there are very important and very well studied um, inhibitory pathways that are also engaged by the tumor in order to repress the uh, effective functions of those T cells. And uh, the two um, most prominent examples of those inhibitory pathways is the uh, CD80 and 86 interaction with CTLA4 on the T cell side and the PDL1, PD1 um, uh, interaction uh, between DCs uh, and T cells. So, using therapeutic antibodies now blocking or let's say breaking up these interactions and therefore blocking. Um, these inhibitory pathways. We're kind of releasing the brakes that the tumor is putting on the uh, effective function of those T cells. Now, when combining DC-based vaccines with checkpoint inhibitor blockade, we are basically providing the T cells with more um, antigen presentation in the lymph node and at the same time taking away the blockade through the CTLA-4 axis, meaning that we are um, expanding higher numbers of activated T cells. And at the same time, in the peripheral tissue, so in the effective phase, these T cells are getting less exhausted because they receive less signals through their PD-1 uh, receptor. And our clinical collaborator in Brussels, Professor Bart Nines, has already shown that the combination of DC-based vaccines and checkpoint inhibitor blockade is very feasible and safe. In his case, he used the CDC2s together with anti-CTLA4, anti-PD-1 and anti-PD-L1 uh, in prostate cancer patients. For the future now, he's looking into um, creating synergies between the DC subsets, namely the CDC1s and CDC2s together with his um, checkpoint, immunity, checkpoint inhibitor blockades. So taken together, we think that by um, developing the blood DC enrichment culture system, that it's tailored to address all the requirements that we mentioned earlier, uh, that are very important for sustainable cell manufacturing, we can now address um, questions um, on which DC subset to choose, how to improve the neoantigen prediction, how to stratify our patient groups and cohorts right, maybe even engineering our dendritic cells. And then we can also work on improving their maturation so that they may migrate in vivo even better. And finally, as uh, just mentioned now, um, this opens the door also to obtain um, reproducible qualities of DC subset preparations in order to combine these with other immunotherapies. And so on the basis of this uh, blood DC system, we can now address all these questions in order to enhance the efficacy of DC therapy. Uh, uh, please take note of our disclaimer. And last but not least, um, uh, we uh, would like to thank all the people that were involved in uh, developing this DC system. There is um, all the members of the R&D team including myself and uh, our manager and our team. Obviously, uh, Christina and uh, her team from product management and clinical development, all our scientific collaborators. Um, and thank you very much for your attention. And we're very happy to take questions.